Hey, good morning. Welcome to FCC Online. Super glad you're here joining us this morning. We have a new element added to our online service. If you look in the video's description box on YouTube, you'll see a link that'll take you to an online connection card. Much like we do on a Sunday morning, we have the tear off portion of our bulletin where you can get connected with us. If you're new or if you've been with us a long time, there's a spot you can put prayer requests and things in. But if you want to, you can get, go head over there and fill that out. Again, whether you're new or you've been with us for a while, that's just a way we can connect with you even in this online realm. Today we're going to be wrapping up our series Jesus on Trauma and we're going to be looking at some of those more self-inflicted traumas, if you will. Some of those personal failures and mistakes that we've made that have left in a lasting emotional scar and damage. I'm super excited today because we're going to be looking at a story from Jesus' ministry where he steps right into the moment of a huge failure in someone's life and his response to it encompasses his entire ministry of why Jesus came on earth. It fully encompasses the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I'm super excited to get to share that with you guys this morning. Before we do that, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll jump into the word this morning. Let's pray. Father God, I pray you just bless this time we have together today and just that you would use this for your glory and honor, God. We thank you that you step into the messy moments of our lives, God, and that you you care for us, God, and that you don't just leave us in the muck and mire of, of our sin and failure, God. I thank you that we have this opportunity to open your word, and I pray that your spirit would just lead us and guide us as we dive into this this morning. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are wrapping up our series, Jesus on Trauma. And as a reminder, trauma is the Greek word for a wound. Classically refers to a physical wound, but has evolved and morphed into this idea that encompasses an emotional wounding as well. Something that takes time to heal, can require special treatment to heal, something that leaves a mark or a scar, something to be remembered by. And over the last several weeks, we've gotten to look at how Jesus throughout his ministry has um, addressed some of these various issues in people's lives and issues that we still deal with today. We've looked at how Jesus has stepped into issues of identity, anxiety, grief, and bullies. And as we've looked at some of these, you could almost describe those as external wounds, something caused by a wounding caused by something that happened or by something that someone else did. But today we're going to flip things around a little bit and we're going to be looking at those self-inflicted kinds of wounds. We're going to be looking at our failures and our mistakes, the things that we have no one else to blame but ourselves for. This last summer, uh, we were out having some friends over for a barbecue, and I was grilling, getting everything ready, and I was, in, in my head, I was running behind on things, and so I was trying to work quickly, and I had a watermelon, I was trying to get cut up, and I was cutting and cutting and cutting, and I, at one point, just forgot to move my thumb out of the way, and I took a nice big slice out of my thumb instead of the watermelon, um, and, and that was just because, that was just a failure in my own recognition of, like, I didn't need to be rushing, um, and I wasn't really behind and I should have just slowed down and paying attention but it was this failure moment and it, it left a mark there's still definitely a scar there um, and it took quite a while to heal and when we start thinking about like our traumas and our failures sometimes it can be easy to maybe kind of downplay some of those things or to make light of some of our failures we've made but the failures that Jesus is talking about today, the things that we're gonna be addressing today, aren't those like funny online video fail worthy kinds of failures. These are failures that go a lot deeper. And again, we could all sit around and swap stories all day about just some of the funny, dumb things that we've done in our life, but these are things that go a little deeper. These are the things that maybe keep you up at night as you're getting ready to go to bed. This is the thing that you think about that, man, I just, I wish I could go back and not say that or not do that one thing. So something you maybe don't want people to find out about. Maybe it's a sin that you'd, you're you just not ready or you haven't confronted yet. These are failures and mistakes that maybe just aren't so funny. But what I'm excited about today, the text we're going to be looking at, is we get to look at a story from Jesus' ministry where he steps into the middle of a hugely traumatic moment in someone's life. But from it, as we're looking at it today, we get to see his heart for us even in the midst of of our greatest failures and that we can still find hope in the person and work of Jesus Christ. 
So go ahead, grab your Bible or grab your phone and open up to John chapter 8. And as you're opening up there, you might notice something kind of funny about this section in that it might be in brackets or that first section of John chapter 8 is all in italics or in some versions, it just simply might not be there. What's that about? Well, some of your Bibles might have a footnote that says something along the lines of the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 7, 53 through 8, 11. So what are we supposed to do with that? Well, this is not the main point of where we want to go today, but this is a really, really important aside that we need to make. I'm going to try to do my best to, as quickly and thoroughly as I can, get into this before we dive into the rest of where we're going for the morning. Um, because what we're dealing with here is an issue of textual criticism. What is textual criticism? Textual criticism is a field of study that seeks to determine what an original manuscript actually said. In this case, we're looking at what the original manuscript of the book of John that was originally written actually said. Now, one thing we take for granted is that we don't actually have that original copy to look at. Materials degrade over time, and that's just simply been lost to history. But what we do have to look at, and where textual criticism is so important, is we do have a large body of copies of the original manuscript to look at and to study from. However, one thing we just have to acknowledge when we're looking at a copy is that copy errors, editing errors, do happen sometimes. For example, one of the things I do in my quiet time sometimes in the morning is I will copy out a chunk of scripture. Um, it's, it's really encouraging. I'd, I'd encourage you to try it too. It's, it's a really cool way to just kind of meditate on God's word. Not, and if, if you're like a speed reader or you just kind of skim like me sometimes, it's a good way to slow yourself down and to really engage with God's word. But the other morning I was sitting there doing that and as I'm doing it and I'm writing this out, I, I noticed like I miss a word every once in a while or I might add something there because my brain it sounds like that's where it should go or I'd miss a punctuation or I'd misspell something because spelling's kind of hard without autocorrect in your journal sometimes. But these copy mistakes do happen and sometimes there's little editing errors and stuff here like there but this is where textual criticism ste steps in to look at the overall body of work of all these copies to preserve the original inspired text with the or what the original manuscript of john was trying to get across and what you'll find is that the bible holds up very very well to textual criticism and that there's not a lot of sections like this but that this is a section that we have to deal with and a couple of the methods for looking at biblical criticism are you have the majority method where you look at the overall body of works and you try and determine if this, if this word's there a thousand times and then there's this word that's used 20 times, we're going to go with the one that has the a thousand. It's the majority there. There's also the eclectic method of it, which again, as we see being done here, it says the earliest manuscripts. This is kind of giving more weight towards those earlier manuscripts versus giving if something was added if something they only found it a little bit later it does prompt some questions and so that leaves us here what do we do with this section in john 8. so does that mean we just toss this out <laughs> and then it kind of begs the question what else should we toss out well, as we go through this this morning, my, my goal is to show you a couple of things. And that one is that this story is really consistent and harmonious with who Jesus is. So do we just toss it out? What else should we toss out? Well, since we're teaching this morning, obviously you can kind of figure out where we stand with it. We, we feel it's something that should be taught, something that is an important story for, from Jesus' life. And that's because when you look at this story, it it is consistent with who Jesus is. It, it's, it's harmonious with the character of Jesus. And, and throughout this morning, as we kind of bring in some supporting texts, I really hope to show you that, that this isn't something that's out of place, that's out of character for Jesus, that this is something that really does make sense with who Jesus is. And that through this story, we're gonna see a really important aspect of the person and work of Jesus Christ, fulfilling the mission he said he came to accomplish here on earth. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's go ahead and read John 8, starting in verse 2. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. 
Well, story moves pretty quickly here, but it just starts out, sets the scene of Jesus teaching in the temple, and then this group of Pharisees and teachers of the law who don't like Jesus, who are seeking to discredit Jesus or to get Jesus out of their lives in whatever way they possibly can, brings forth a question. They bring forth a problem, a conundrum for Jesus to solve. They bring forth this problem in the shape of a woman who has been caught in the act of adultery this heinous act of adultery. Now, when we started today, I asked you about what your failure was, to look a little bit deeper at your failures, those things that, again, you have a hard time sleeping at night because of those things you wish you could go back and change, that thing that you really don't want other people to know about. Try and get yourself back in the headspace. I, I know we took a little aside for textual criticism and stuff like that, um, but try and get yourself back in that headspace because it can be really easy to look at this story and to just act as an observer in this moment. But I would challenge you to put yourself where that woman stands, to put yourself there and to just really feel the depth and weight of your sin, the depth and weight of your mistakes, because she's being brought before an entire group of people. Again, this is that sin you don't want everyone to know about, but is suddenly being drug up in front of an entire group of people. Try to put yourself there if you can, because it's, it's so important. It sets up the rest of the story for us, because in order to really understand the depth of what Jesus does as we go through the story, You've really got to be there to understand the depth and reality of your sin that, yes, you might not be um, challenged to be put to death for your sin. You might not ever have this sin drug in front of everybody, but we need to understand that the damage we've done to ourselves because of our sin, we need to really come to terms with the damage we've done to others because of our sin, because that makes what Jesus then does later so much deeper. It helps us get a better grasp of how Jesus, of the person and work of Jesus Christ. So do what you can to get yourself in that headspace. Put yourself there. Don't just observe in this story. But as we're looking at this, again, it, the story, the narrative acknowledges that like this is a trap. They're seeking to trap Jesus and to discredit him and to just get them out of their lives. And they've got a pretty airtight case so far. Because on the one hand, if Jesus just dismisses it and says, whatever, it's not a big deal, um, he would seem to be going against the law of Moses, the law that these Pharisees and the teachers of the law were seeking to uphold. In Deuteronomy 22, 22, it says, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil, this evil from evil, this evil from Israel. Um, yeah, to just kind of, you know, brush it off seems to fly in the face of God's law. And on the other hand of that, you know, if he were to say, you know what, we should stone her. Give me a rock. Um, he would be flying into the authority of Rome. And then the Jewish leaders wouldn't have to have anything to do with him because Rome would take care of him at that point. Because when Rome was occupying Israel, they actually took away their official, their right for official execution for just religious offenses. And we even see this happen in Jesus' life later when he is crucified. The Jewish leaders don't actually crucify Jesus. It's Rome that does it under tremendous pressure from the Jewish leaders to do so, and they don't even really get him on sound charges. But it's not for a religious reason, it's for Roman rule kind of reason. And so in that, if Jesus was to say, yes, let's stone her, he's going to run right into Rome, and then the Pharisees can just wipe their hands at Jesus. He's Rome's problem now. So it's a clear setup. It, they're trying to set Jesus up to fail. But in that setup as well, we also see there's some elements of it that are pretty flimsy to it, too. And there's some things that might be condemning of those who are doing the setup. If you remember in the Deuteronomy 22, 22 verse I read, if you were paying attention, it says, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. I see no mention of a man in this story. And the part that just makes this even more heartbreaking and just more disgusting, frankly, is they stand before Jesus and they tell him that this woman was caught in the act of 
adultery. Throughout the Bible, it tells us to um, bring a charge against someone for witnesses. It's more than one witness. Don't have to use your imagination too much to figure out how that ended up happening. But it's this moment where they have brought this woman that they have, they have not only set up Jesus, they have set up this woman and are using her shame and her guilt for their own purposes. And Jesus looks at the situation and as he does so many times throughout his ministry, he clearly sees past their deception. And while they're saying, choose A or choose B, Jesus looks and finds the C. So let's pick up the story in the second half of verse six. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now, for, first thing that like everyone asks about this section when we look at it is, what on earth was Jesus doing in the dirt? And I'm here to tell you today that we have no idea. We, re we really don't. It's, it's not there. If it was important enough to record, it might have been recorded. Again, this might have been a story passed on from different people and stuff like that. And so we just don't know. But that's not the important part about this section. I, I really love this section a lot because it's just a really cool moment in Jesus' ministry. It almost is like something like kind of out of a Western. There's all this like tension. Like you can just imagine how tense of a moment and how like exciting that was. Like just how the energy of that situation. And Jesus is just as cool as can be. Because again, he takes a moment where he's been given two options. You can either completely lose all your credit as a teacher or you can go die to the Romans essentially. And he says, what about this third option here that you guys didn't mention? He does this in a way that he does throughout his ministry where he answers their question with a question or a challenge of his own. And what he's doing is by asking this question, by giving this challenge, he's giving the original question asker a moment to really just like think of this themselves. It's a, it's a great teaching technique. It's one that a lot of philosophers have used to teach over time is to just let the person who's asking the question answer it themselves. And the question he asks them is a fairly simple one. And one, if we're honest, I think we can all answer pretty easily in that let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And in the immediate context of this situation, what Jesus is accusing them of is essentially like, again, who's got the greater sin issue here? Because again, you've brought this woman, you've caught in adultery for your own nefarious purposes to even try and get someone, if it works out all the way that you want, to get the person you're trying to accuse, get them killed in the end. And so again, you've got this person who they've just brought, who, who did commit a sin. Jesus is not denying that she committed a sin, but he's also turning it around and saying like, hey, look yourself in the mirror a little bit too. Again, you have entrapped somebody, you have lied, you aren't even following the law to the letter of the law in the fact that like, you bring this woman to me, but to complete the full law, we need the guy here too. Like if we're gonna stone somebody, we're gonna stone two people together. They haven't done any of that. And then again, they're trying to entrap Jesus in this. And so again, he, he's turning it back on them saying like, which one of you by participating in this just, circus we've got going on right now is not guilty. And they get it. They understand. And they begin to walk away. Now, outside of that context where we can kind of take the statement and, and just to be reminded ourselves is that none of us are without sin. This is something we see come up throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. This is not something that should be news to us. None of us are perfect. It shouldn't be news, but sometimes we have a really hard time admitting that. People don't like to admit that we've made mistakes. We like to, again, try and downplay some of our mistakes. We like to either make light of it or downplay it. Oh, it wasn't really that bad. Was it though? And maybe there's something else you're not telling me. 
You see in Ecclesiastes 7.20 it says, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. John 1.8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, we're lying to ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And from this statement, and from this recognition that none of us are without sin, we can learn something from either perspective, from the perspective of the condemned, of that woman, of ourselves and our own sin, and from those who are doing the condemning as well. Because sometimes we find ourselves on that side of things as well. And the things we can learn is that for the condemned, it's nice to know we're not alone in our problems. Goodness gracious. Like, again, for us to admit that, like, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God is to say, like, man, we, we can humbly be together and try to help each other. You see, one of the things that happens in, in sin or in our mistakes, sometimes we can think that I'm the only one who's ever done something so awful. But at the same time, when we come together and we maybe start to confess those things, we start to grow in our fellowship with one another as the body of Christ, we might start to find as we hear people's stories about how Jesus is working in their lives that, oh, you've struggled with that too. You struggle with your anger? Huh, I struggle with my anger. I fly off the handle all the time. How do you deal with it? Here's how I've dealt with it. Here's times I've gotten it right. Here's times I haven't gotten it right. But it's so comforting. We can grow and we can challenge one another when we just admit that, like, I'm not perfect. And we can do this boldly knowing that, like, Again, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, and so we don't really have anything that we need to hide there. We can even help each other grow from that. But also on the side of being the condemner, being the one doing the condemning, what we should hopefully be learning from this statement, from this declaration of that, that none of us are perfect, is that it should change how we approach the sin of others. And this is something Jesus addressed at another time in his ministry. In Matthew 7, 1 through 5, it says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged with the measure you use, and it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You see, even in that moment, how we approach others in their sin should change because of the full recognition that I'm a sinner as well as you are. Because when we don't have that level of humility, when we can't say that, we, we turn just into the Pharisees and those of the law. Maybe we're not trying to condemn Jesus, but we can use it for our own purposes. We can use it to maybe feel better about ourselves to, you know, again, hide our failures, but then make ourselves feel better because, ah, at least I'm not like that one right there. But it's this recognition we need to come to that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this clearly, when Jesus says this and Jesus poses this question to them, it clearly has an impact on those who heard it because they're like, yeah, nope, I am, I am definitely not without sin in this moment. And they get out of there. But in that moment, Jesus just doesn't leave it there as like, ah, you're all sinners, get out of here kind of thing. Jesus doesn't leave it there, especially with the woman who's been brought to be condemned, the woman who was accused and was going to be murdered, essentially. Jesus didn't leave her there, and he doesn't leave us just mired in that moment of sin. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and and leave your life of sin. This is that beautiful conclusion of the story. This is just a really beautiful moment as a whole because Jesus, again, doesn't just leave her stuck in the moment, doesn't just leave anyone who's there listening to this in the moment of like, you're all sinners. It's like, okay, cool, we're all sinners. He tells us what to do with our sin. He, he gives us a way to move past it, to move on, to take our failures and how we grow from them and how and what we're to do with our failures. He asks her, who's here to condemn you? No one's there to condemn her anymore. She's been freed from this bond of sin and shame. She's been forgiven. 
again, put yourself there in that moment. This this moment where you are literally going to be executed for this sin that you have committed, this mistake, this failure that you have made. You're going to be executed for that. And then you're not. You have this moment where you've you've been defended, you've had someone step in for you, and that sin that you committed, that shame and guilt you feel for that, it's changed now. She has been forgiven. In Romans 8, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives, uh, gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here on just a practical, real-life way. And Jesus is accomplishing what he said he came to do. John 3.16 is one we like to quote a lot, but there's also 17 as well with that. And that's where Jesus pretty much lays out his mission for why he has come to dwell amongst man. It says in John 3, 16 through 17, that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. If you think back to that verse in 1 John that was talking about, if, if, we, if we claim to be without sin, we are, we, we are deceiving ourselves. In that next chapter of John, 1 John chapter 2, he gives us an encouragement as well, pointing us back to the same thing that Jesus has come to do. It says in 1 John 2, 1 through 2, it says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. She was shown grace and mercy. She was given a second chance by Jesus. She has now a new life. A life that was to be taken away from her has been given back to her through the person and work of Jesus Christ. But then Jesus goes on, takes it a step further. Now that she's been shown this grace, what do we do with this grace? He says, go now and leave your life of sin. You've been given a second chance. Here's what to go and do with it. He fully recognizes that what she did was sinful, not excusing her behavior. Again, how it was brought to light and things like that. Like that was terrible. Yes. But also recognize like you were guilty of sin as well, as we all are. Again, we talked about that. We're all guilty of sin. And so we've been shown this grace, but we're called to grow in that grace as well. In Romans 6, 1 through 2, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? It's this moment that Jesus calls her, and he calls all of us in our failures and our mistakes, that now we've been shown grace in our mistakes and our failures to repent, to turn away from that previous way we were living, to turn away from that life of sin, to turn away from that sinful behavior, to move past our failures and mistakes in repentance. In James 4, 7 through 10, it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You see, one of the things that I think is so important for us to understand is that not only do we glorify God in the great things we do, we also can glorify God in our not-so-great moments. Again, that's not to say, like we just read in Romans, that we should keep sinning so grace may increase. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that even in our mistakes, even in our failures, we can still follow God. We can still bring glory to God through the person and work of Jesus Christ by trusting in what he has done for us on the cross and paying for our sins and turning and leaving that life we lived before, repenting and turning to God and putting our trust in him. You see, if you've been following Jesus for a long time, this is, this is a call for us to confess and repent. This is a reminder of the grace that we find in the person and work of Jesus and what we're supposed to do with it. 
And if this if this is new to you, if if this is news to you, you're hearing this for the first time today, or you've maybe hearing it a different way you hadn't heard it before. A, I'm super super excited you get to hear that you get to hear this today. And B, I, I hope I hope it's encouraging. I hope it's challenging to you. I hope it's inviting to you. I hope you you hear this and you want to step into this grace and love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. That even even if you feel like you've just completely messed up, you can still find hope and grace and repentance in Jesus. And we can do that by putting our trust in him. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you prof- you profess your faith and are saved. You can put your trust in Jesus no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, you can find hope in Jesus. You can, you, much like that woman, have your life that was going away it should not have been going, that was leading towards death, and Jesus can come in and turn that around from you. You can find new hope and new life in Jesus. So, to wrap things up today, I love this story so much because it's such a beautiful picture of grace. It's such a beautiful picture of what Jesus did on the cross for us. It really helps to illustrate for me what Jesus was doing on the cross. Because sometimes that can be kind of an abstract thing, but when we put it into these terms to realize that this woman was condemned to death, as we are in our own sins, but Jesus stepped in and gave her new life, gave her a second chance, gave her that grace and that love, we too can find that same hope in Jesus. And if, if this has stirred you in some way today, I, I pray that it has been. This has honestly been a really challenging message for me to put together this week. But I, I pray that it was encouraging for you. And if you have more questions about it, if you would like to take some steps, if you'd like to know what following Jesus looks like, if you'd like to publicly declare that, hey, I am following Jesus right now, I would. I want to put my trust in him. I want to, um, as Acts 2.38 says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins, to receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. If you want that, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can email me, drew at we, the letter R, FCC.com. I'd love to talk with you more about what that looks like in whatever way we can. But um, again, I hope this was encouraging for you. I hope this was a reminder, if you've been following Jesus, of the grace that we have in him. I'm going to close today with prayer, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Father God, we love you. Thank you for this day. Pray you just use your word for your glory, God. I pray that you would um, just be at work in all of our hearts, God. Remind us constantly of this grace you have for each one of us. Help us to show this grace to those around us and to glorify you in all that we do, God, even in our mistakes. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.